All right, hey guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so happy to have Will and Matt Johnson on, on the team. So Matt is our lead engineer at Modus and Will takes care of everything. Dev experience, dev relation. I don't know the difference between the both. So I, I call him everything. Um, so we are live across all the social channels. Please let us know where you're joining us from and feel free to drop your questions in the chat. So today we're gonna talk about Modus, which is our open source platform. And then we have the co-creator of Modus, which is Matt. So he'll just give us a good deep dive and then we'll, we'll also give you a cool demo. So please feel free to ask your, uh, drop your questions, ask your questions as well. All right, over to you, sir. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm Matt. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, I am one of the creators of Modus. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely a team effort, um, but uh, I lead up the engineering work on the Modus team. Um, and have kind of put together the majority of the Modus architecture. So um, this is going to be a little bit of a deep dive. If you haven't tried Modus yet, um, I strongly encourage you to uh, give it give it a try. Like everything, you can get started for free. Uh, it's real simple. Just go to hypermode.com and walk through the Modus tutorials for getting started. Um, you'll find it quite easy. But we're going to go into a little bit today of like what are the different components to Modus and um and then how does it actually work um which is something that we haven't really spent a lot of time on up to now so um first slide i can cooperate here um this is just a little bit of overview of the different parts of the modus system so there's the development uh world where you are working on your local computer to build a what we call a modus app and then there's the production environment how are you actually going to run this application in in production and one of the things about modus is it's a serverless platform so notice that there's there's very little on here in the way of like setting up uh docker or kubernetes or uh any of the other types of infrastructure components that you might be used to um, that's wrapped up for you in production in in our hyper mode uh hosting platform um, and we layer in a bunch of other stuff for you in hyper mode that we won't be getting into in, in the modus discussion, but things like observability um, and, and history and logs and uh, access control, uh, authentication, all those kinds of things are handled by the host infrastructure. Um, but modus itself is a pretty lightweight runtime and it's based on WebAssembly. And that that is a little eye-opening for some people, but I wanna talk a little bit about why WebAssembly. And a lot of it comes down to what we can actually do in WebAssembly that is, um, you know, things you might be able to achieve a similar uh, result in other uh, platforms, but you're not necessarily going to have the same guarantees uh, in production. Um, and, and the main thing by that, that the WebAssembly provides is uh, sandboxing. So notice these little dotted lines kind of, kind of drawn around here. On the left-hand side here, we have the CLI. That's the the get where you get started with Modus. You do a quick install, and you have the Modus CLI. We'll do a little demo after this, and I'll show it to you. And uh, using the CLI and one of our SDKs, you will create a Modus application. So you'll take your Modus source code and a small little file we call the uh, the manifest, but it's a Modus.json file that just kind of says, you know, this is the configuration for my application. And all that's going to move into um, through a, a compilation process using our SDK and, and the compiler of your choice uh, will become a WebAssembly file, which is a, a binary file. And I want to pause for just a second and talk about uh, WebAssembly from my perspective, because I think a lot of people who are, are new to WebAssembly are just thinking about WebAssembly as a way to like run another language in the browser. And that, that is like one of WebAssembly's goals is like, hey, I can take uh, Rust and run it next to my JavaScript in the browser. But that's not the only thing it can do. And so taking a step back from WebAssembly um, from, the, from that scenario, and another way to look at WebAssembly is just as an instruction set. So uh, if you're used to thinking about uh, writing any sort of native application and you say, okay, well, I need to build a Linux x64 version of this app, or I need to build a Mac uh, ARM64 version of this app. Um, those are platform specific instruction sets. And the compiled binary is designed to run on that operating system uh, with that set of CPU instructions. Uh, WebAssembly is very similar to that in that the internals of a WebAssembly file are 
instructions for a WebAssembly virtual machine. Um, so you can really think about WASM as another target, the same way you think about x64 or ARM. Um, but where is it going to run? It runs inside the Modus runtime. And we're going to spend a little more time in that on the next slide. Like, what is the Modus runtime? How does it work? Uh, how does the WASM actually execute? And, and why does that matter? Like, I'm sure a lot of you are asking, like, why does that even matter? Um, but uh, as far as a basic workflow goes, like, you use a CLI, you write some source code, you, uh, you run that code or you compile that code, and then you run it. And you can do that loop. Um, locally on your box as many times as you need to in order to actually build your app. Um, and again, I'll show you that here in the demo following the slides. Um, but why, why do it at all? Um, mostly it's so we have access to all the different services that we, we have available. Um, the Hypermode infrastructure provides its own AI model hosting um, and provides uh, data services on, uh, on dgraph. Um, we also have uh, external connectivity to uh, Postgres type databases. Um, and you really, you can call any, any uh, REST API or GraphQL API that you can think of. Um, so pulling that all together into like a production service where, you know, in your app, you're just writing the business logic and the entire rest of the infrastructure is all configured for you is what makes this sort of a serverless platform rather than uh, um, something that you would deploy into a virtual machine, for example. Um, so yeah, let's let's dive right in. So what is the hypermode runtime? Um, now this is this is a pretty a deep internals kind of look about what we do. Um, one thing that uh, you'll notice, like if we take it from the top down on this architecture, is like we are we are serving HTTP, but we're not just serving any HTTP. We're specifically serving GraphQL, um, and that's really cool because like if you've ever um, actually called any of the larger uh web services that are out there like GitHub, is, for example you call their rest api the rest api is pretty verbose and you can like only want one piece of data like you know what was the last commit and on, on a repo and you'll get back this huge blob of text that you've got to send all the way down to your client and pull out the piece that you want uh, but github has a graphql API, and the nice thing there is you can say you know what here's a query for the specific data that i want and please just give me back the specific data that i want um, so likewise, we do the same thing in Modus. You can have a very extensive, uh, rich uh, set of types and schema in your data, and your user only needs to query the things that they need. Um, that, that there's a lot of benefit to that. So uh, that's one of the reasons we leaned into GraphQL. The other reason we leaned into GraphQL is because our, our origins at Hypermode come from dgraph. You'll notice we have a dgraph client way down on the list. And uh, we want to be able to, to uh, promote GraphQL all the way through the stack. Um, so from, from the way in and into your functions and into the processing and all the way back out to calling the database, uh, we can make this GraphQL call end to end. And we are doing a lot more to make that even uh, more interesting as we evolve the platform. But um, so how does this work? We, um, we get this HTTP request and we need to, um, we need to basically parse it apart. So we start at the top with a, um, an, an HTTP handler that's specifically designed for GraphQL. And for, for a lot of these pieces, actually for both this piece and the one right below it, we use a library called uh, GraphQL Go Tools because our runtime is written in Go. And that library is made by a company called Wondergraph with a W. Um, they use it in their Cosmo product and we use it in Modus. Uh, and it's used in a whole lot of other stuff. So if you want to check out um, Wondergraph's GraphQL Go tools, um, I highly recommend it. Um, the nice thing about that is we get some really, really cool uh, high performance uh, out of the actual execution engine. The whole thing is designed around uh, building up an abstract syntax tree of the, the, uh, the schema and of the incoming queries and matching those um, through this whole like parser planner process. Um, and what it really boils down to is by the time we actually go to, to execute a function, like the amount of, of time spent at the GraphQL layer is on the order of a few milliseconds. It's really, really, really small. Um, but how do we make that happen? Well, we take this library, which is just a library. You have to actually use the library. <laughs> and um, we, we layer on top of it a, a schema generator that, uh, where the schema actually comes from your function definition. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, in the demo. 
And um, and then we also build in uh, in GraphQL Go tools. They they work through concepts of data sources. So um, not using Modis, but another type of data source might be like just a SQL Server. Um, so there are a lot of scenarios around that already. But what we've done is said, you know what, the data source here is a WASM engine that you can run functions in. Um, so through the data source, we come into the internals of the rest of, of what makes Modis special. Um, and what is ultimately its job is, is to run your application inside this WebAssembly sandbox. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there just to, to give myself a break. But um, I want you to think thinking about, um, OK, now I've received a request coming in from HTTP. I need to execute it. Well, what is it executing? It's executing some bit of code. And where did that code come from? It wasn't compiled with the runtime. It was supplied to the runtime by, by loading it as WebAssembly. And so this, this code is by its, its nature, it's untrusted. Um, you know, you wrote it, so you trust your own code, but we at running the platform, the framework, can't trust that code 100%. You know, what if there's a malicious hacker trying to use the system to do something nefarious? Uh, what if there's somebody running on the same hardware that's trying to access um, somebody else's uh, memory space? Uh, the nice thing about WebAssembly, and one of the main reasons we chose it is because everything that we run here is inside a sandbox meaning every single request, every single instance of, of an HTTP request, all the way from receiving that request to executing the function and giving back the response, runs in its own memory space, in its own um, instance on a WASM virtual machine. Um, that may sound like magic, but it's it, in some ways it is. Uh, but it, it's, it's actually uh, really, really cool. Um, and for that, we use a, another Go library called Wazero. W-A-Z-E-R-O, which is a Go-based WebAssembly engine. And so uh, the nice thing about that is there, again, this is another area that takes a lot of concentration and, and focus. Um, and the Wazero team has done a, a really excellent job at creating a high-performant Go-only server. Um, Wazero has no um, C dependencies or other external dependencies, uh, which is why they call it law zero because it has zero dependencies. Um, but we can use it and leverage that to really bring a high performance as an experience into Otis. Um, one of the things I really love about law zero is it has built into it an ahead of time compiler. This AOT compiler that we, we leverage um, comes from law zero. And what it basically means is by the time we're running this, it's not actually WASM code anymore. It is now native code for the processor that the runtime is running on. So if we run the most runtime on an x64 box, we actually have is isolated purpose-built x64 instructions that are ready to execute. And they still run within that same dedicated WebAssembly memory space. Um, and, and that alone can be interesting to think about. When we think about memory on a computer. So like, imagine you just put this aside for a second. Imagine you just have like an express application. Um, what's its memory space? Um, it's actually the, the memory space for each request is the entire memory space for that process, which is already on the operating system in a way that may be accessible to another process. Um, and so like infrastructure level things have tried to uh, address this, like Kubernetes does a lot of um, uh, coordination around Docker containers in order to keep those things kind of isolated from each other. But we don't even have that concern. We don't have to worry about that. We can make that memory space unique to the request, not just unique to the process. Um, so um, this will, will shrink and grow as needed for the application. Um, but really, it's just like a lightweight, linear, isolated piece of memory for that request and response. Um, so your code can't actually even try to access another memory space. It doesn't have it. It's not addressable. Um, so that's a really, really good on the security side. Um, the other nice thing it does on the AFT compiled stuff be, by being native code is just the performance is native performance. You may be giving us uh, assembly script or Go source code, but by the time it actually executes, it, it's native code. It's as if you wrote it in C. Um, and because it's in a unique memory space, we don't even need to do garbage collection. We can let that, gar that memory just grow because we throw it out when we're done with it um, on every request. 
So that's another nice uh, advantage of, of being in the WASM space. Um, so what do we actually do in here? Like, why is this, why is this important for MODIS? Well, when you actually get into the internals of WebAssembly, WebAssembly is really low level. Like, if you haven't tried WebAssembly yet, go try it and just, just go take a look. Um, one of the things that will probably annoy you right off the bat is just passing data back and forth is really complicated. Um, the, the WebAssembly standard itself doesn't even support strings. So how do you move large bits of binary data back and forth or the strings back and forth or structs or classes or arrays or lists uh, or nested graph structures? Uh, any of those things is actually extremely tedious and if you were to try to do it yourself. Uh, so one of the things that MODIS does is it has built into it um, this concept of a WASM adapter. This is, this is our concept. And inside the WASM adapter, we have language specific uh, understanding of the language that you're using. So right now, MODIS supports WebAssembly, or sorry, yeah, take a step back a minute. MODIS supports two languages, uh, Go using the tiny Go compiler and assembly script, which is a TypeScript like experience that compiles directly to, uh, to WebAssembly. So inside these WASM adapters inside the runtime, we have an understanding of, oh, that WASM file, it was built with Go. And therefore it uses Go's string concepts and Go's struct concepts and Go's pointers. Uh, and we understand the memory layout of, of how those things work in Go. And so we can directly talk to that memory space in a way that your application can also talk to. Um, on the assembly script side, it's similar. It's just not identical. Um, assembly script doesn't have structs, it has classes. And classes are manage objects and they, they marshal differently. So there's, there's lots of nuance to that. And I think that some of the other solutions out there are trying to abstract that on the compiler side. Um, and there's, there's pros and cons of doing so, but putting it inside the runtime and making language specific SDKs actually removes the need for you as a user to worry about this at all. You just write your code and export it and it works. Um, and there's a bunch of other little stuff that the, the runtime needs to do. Like it needs, it needs storage. It needs to know how, like, where are you actually loading this stuff from? Um, it needs, it needs secrets access. So like, if you've got environment variables with API keys, like how do you actually pass them through? And, and there's a bunch of other little things that are happening inside the Modus runtime that really pull an application through end to end. Um, one of the ones I, I really like to, uh, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say I love to spend time in, but is uh, probably one of those powerful things that we have is, um, all that memory marshaling I was talking about with the WASM adapters. We don't figure that out when the function runs, we figure it out ahead of time. Uh, when you load a bit of WASM into MODIS and say, Hey, here's my MODIS app. We introspect over it and we read out of it, um, any bit of metadata that we might've written into it during compilation. And we build for you an execution plan. So by the time that that actual query comes in from the GraphQL data source, you know, it only spent a few milliseconds here. It actually is like just less than a couple milliseconds to run through the execution plan to move all that stuff back and forth and run the actual application. Um, and that's important because if we were spending time on every request trying to figure out how to actually make those calls, um, that's sort of like what you've, you've heard in other languages about how the cost of reflection, uh, we would we'd be bearing that cost on every request. So instead we bear it up front. We bear it when we, when we load the WASM and then we build an execution plan and execute that against your code. Oh, I've been talking a lot. Um, all right, so let's get out of this middle layer for a minute. Uh, what can you do with MODIS? Well, we have these things we call host services or sometimes we call them host functions or host APIs, depending on, on your perspective, the runtime offer services that are exposed through uh, functions that are through APIs that you can call through your functions, but it's basically all the same concept. And uh, what can you do? So you can make HTTP calls outbound uh, and receive data. That's super important. Um, you could just use that to make GraphQL, but we wanted to make that uh, more end-to-end uh, -end, uh, complete. So we have a, a dedicated GraphQL client built in. Uh, we also have a dgraph client built in. So if you're talking to dgraph using our DQL, uh, language, like you don't have to go load a dgraph client. It's just built in for you. 
Um, we've built a SQL client in that right now um, can talk to Postgres and Postgres compatible databases like Neon or Superbase or any of the other um, hosted Postgres that you want to use. Um, we are probably uh, going to be expanding that to support other types of, of SQL databases. Um, so that'll be interesting. Um, probably the most interesting one that we have is we have a, a models interface. So if you want to um, talk to an AI model, which is something you'll definitely want to do in the context of a modest application, um, you don't have to go pull in SDKs from different uh, AI companies. We have built in uh, an open AI compatible uh, interface layer. And we also have um, additional model interfaces for talking to things that do like embeddings or uh, classification or you know, a variety, a wide variety of different um, interfaces for different models. And it's extensible. So if you find that you, know, you want to bring your own model and it doesn't have the interface in Modis, you can add that easily. Um, and then this last thing kind of off to the side is something we were calling Hypermode Collections before we came up with the name Modis. Um, it is still available as part of Modis. Uh, but basically what this is, is an in-memory uh, data store that you can access that at the moment is um, persisting its data to a backend Postgres database. Um, the reason it's kind of off to the side is we're working on revamping that into a uh, in-memory version of dgraph that we'll be calling Modis DB. So you'll be hearing more about Modis DB uh, being used for collections and in conjunction with collections in the future. Um, so just keep that in mind. You can use collections today and, and they're pretty cool, but we're going to be making them even better as we go. Um, I think I covered every box on the slide. Um, let's go into a, just a little bit of a demo uh, so you can actually see what this thing is and how it works. So uh, what I've got here, um, and let me just clear my console and zoom in a little bit. Um, I think that's probably good enough. Um, I've got just a very small Modis application. Um, I think I can even close that for the moment. Um, written in assembly script. And so because it's an assembly script app, it's going to um, have a few components that are just common to assembly script app. It's going to have a package JSON file, uh, which is, is just an NPM package JSON file, just like you would find in any JavaScript project or TypeScript project. It's just this is an assembly script project, so it references assembly script and the libraries that it's using are assembly script specific. Uh, so like we use JSON AS to do our JSON parsing. Um, and there's, there's a few other ones that come out of the box, but you can use any library that is, um, that supports assembly script. Um, that doesn't mean you can use any library on NPM. So just keep that in mind, but there are a lot you can use. Um, we have, um, some, you know, lightweight configuration around like ES lint. Uh, but that's just to help keep the project um, pretty. Um, and, but really, the, gut, the guts of the code are off in our index.ts file. Uh, yeah, and yeah, you can see there's a TS config for uh, TypeScript that makes it know that it's an assembly script project. But let's, uh, let's just focus on this file for a minute. And, and what this is going to do is I've got one function that I'm exporting. There's only one, there's two functions in this, but there's only one that I'm exporting. Um, and when you export a function, from index.ts, this is the main export by default. Uh, yes, you can change it to be something else and export from other places, but uh, by default, anything exported from index.ts becomes callable as a modus function. Uh, so that doesn't mean everything needs to be exported. It just means the ones you want as part of your API. Uh, so in this case, I'm creating one function called get random quote, and it's going to return me an augmented quote object, which I've defined right here. And I've used a little bit of, of object-orientedness um, to extend this from a base quote object that has been enabled for JSON. Uh, if in assembly script uh, using the JSON AS library, this at JSON says this class will be JSON serializable. Um, and to make this just a little more friendly, I've aliased the, the fields that come in off of the API. So the API we're using returns an object that has a Q and an A field, but I want to call them quote and author. So alias is just doing that. I could have instead just call this Q, but then that looks ugly in my code. So that's just a nicety. Um, and yep, these are just strings. And uh, I'm going, what I'm going to be doing in this code is retrieving the quote and then augmenting it with AI to add an explanation of the quote. Um, so let's just real quick look at how do I retrieve the quote? 
uh, I'm going to call the actual API using uh, HTTP request. And this HTTP comes from the Modus SDK for assembly script. Uh, I make the request to Zen Quotes is where I'm pulling this from at the moment. Great uh, place to get a random quote for demos. And uh, I'm going to fetch that response. Uh, you'll notice if you're a TypeScript developer, you're like, hey, where's your uh, await or your promise? Uh, assembly script uh, and WASM in general is single threaded um, and doesn't have asynchronous support in that way. Uh, so these are um, sort of blocking type of calls. Um, but that's fine because all of the asynchronicity that you would typically need and await for here comes for you for free by the modus runtime. So don't get hung up on that too much. Um, we're gonna we're gonna fetch that request, uh, make do a little bit of error handling, make sure we we got a good response, and it turns out that this API returns us an, an array of quotes, but just has one in it. So we're gonna deserialize that and get the first item, and that'll give us back the quote. From there, I want to take a little further and say, hey, um, let's explain that quote. So I'm gonna make a prompt, and I'm going to pass the quote and the author to that prompt so that I can get back that augmented quote object. And for here, I'm just gonna, I just made a little sub function. You don't have to, you could do it all in line if you wanted, but it just makes it a little cleaner. Uh, one of the nice things you can do is like, if you're, if you're uh, testing stuff, you can temporarily export that function and now you've got two APIs. Um, but for a nice clean API, I just want it to be one. And um, so this is gonna use the uh, OpenAI interface um, but I'm supplying to it a model that I labeled as text generator. Well, where does that come from? If we look down on the list of files, you'll see Modus JSON, which I highlighted in the slide deck. And Modus JSON is our, our manifest for Modus applications that uh, basically describe, you know, what, how is this application going to behave? Uh, how is it going to play at runtime, whether that's in your dev environment or in production? Because um, this file will make its way to production as well. And what we'll, we're going to tell it is, hey, there's going to be a single endpoint called GraphQL. It is a GraphQL endpoint. Um, and it's going to be protected by bearer token authentication in production. In development, we'll, we'll skip past that so that you don't have to deal with setting up dev for auth. Uh, makes the, the dev experience a little easier. Um, and it's going to go talk to this ZenQuotes API. We do need to add the, the hosts that we are going to be calling to our manifest. And the reason for that is to prevent um, the types of subtle attacks that a user might do if they were to get you to run untrusted code where that code would contain some random host. Um, this, this is like a, a very common way to mitigate, for example, against uh, Bitcoin mining attacks um, or other crypto um, mining attacks. Um, so this, it's just another way to lock down the system, but do keep that in mind. If you, if you make an HTTP call and it doesn't work, you'll need to go add the host to your manifest and then it'll work. Um, and the model we're calling, like I said, I labeled it text generator. That's, that's here. Uh, this is a, uh, an instance of MetaLama, uh, three, uh, with the 3.18, the instruct configuration. Um, uh, and that's provided by Hugging Face, but actually running on hyper mode. Um, so I, because it's running in hyper mode, I don't need to tell it all that much. Um, I can sign into hyper mode on my local machine and it will automatically connect to that model. Um, I can, uh, deploy my modus app to hyper mode and this uh, model will be connected automatically at runtime. So that there you can kind of see the power of like, um, how modus and hyper mode work together. Um, and you could add lots of more models and lots of more connections and there's, this could just continue to expand until you had a very rich application. But I wanted to keep it simple for the sake of this demo. Um, so yeah, I'm going to call that model. And I'm going to pass it two uh, messages, uh, a system message with the instruction of the prompt, um, and then the actual data that I'm working off of as a user message. Um, the model interface has a lot of other capabilities. So if I wanted to pass it, for example, um, a tool message, I could. Um, and we've, we've been doing some experience with tool calling and how to make that easier in Modus, but you absolutely can do tool calling um, today if you want to. Um, we have some customers doing that already. Um, you can even like go into some of the more advanced features of the models and say, you know what, the maximum number of tokens I want to say is 100. That's a mess I want to spend. And since I'm hosting this on hyper mode, I'm not that concerned, but if I was actually directly calling OpenAI, which you can, or Mistral or 
Anthropic or any of the other uh, OpenAI compatible uh, model interfaces, you may want to constrain your tokens. Um, so I'm going to basically just generate that text and then feed it back into my response. Let's go run this. Uh, we'll open a terminal and I'm going to run a command. Um, uh, well, one thing I didn't show you all is that uh, I actually scaffold this whole project with, with our Modus CLI. Um, I'll show that at the end, but I want to show you running this first. But you can use the Modus CLI to say Modus new, and that builds an application that gets you started. But I've got this application already, so I'm just going to say Modus dev. This is our dev time experience. And it's going to compile the application. And since it compiled successfully, uh, it says right here, build succeeded. Um, it's giving me back some information about the application and then the functions that were created. I made, I exported that get random quote function. So that's what I've got. And it's going to return an augmented quote. It takes no parameters, but there's the actual object that it's returning. Pretty straightforward. Um, I could load this in uh, graph code, but you know what? I'm going to actually stop for a second and I'm going to redo that. But this time I'm going to show you the pre-release version of uh, the most runtime. This is something that we're working on, but you can try it right now if you want. Uh, and there's a little bit visual differences, but one of them is that we now have a built-in Graph Explorer uh, or API Explorer. So when I click that link, you'll see I can, it's already populated a, a basic query for me. So let's just run it. And indeed it worked. Uh, I've got a quote here. Does it say, when you're able to employ your will for constructive purposes, you become the controller of your destiny. Destiny, And it tells me the author uh, I've never heard this quote before, but the nice bit here is like, okay, so what? Well, I can explain that quote using AI. Um, and that may seem like obvious, but um, it's also super powerful because if I can, if I can generate data or retrieve data and pass it to an AI for augmentation or analysis, then that can actually get, uh, that, this can be a building block that you can build some really interesting scenarios on. Um, if you, for example, were to call a graph database um, and leverage the power of graph database, then what you're doing here is what they call retrieval augmented generation. Um, and paired with graph database, we have GraphRag. Uh, and there's whole white papers written on GraphRag. Um, so those types of scenarios are things that you can do on Modus. Um, yeah, uh, so end to end. Uh, let me just show you one other quick little cool thing that you can do. Um, I'll just go make a new app. So Lotus new, and this time I'll do a go app. I'll let it, it's going to prompt me here. So I'll just say, yeah, goes fine. And, and it's going to give me a potential demo name, but I'll call it go demo one. Yes, I want to get repository and it's just going to scaffold this app for me. And apparently I need to authenticate, but give me, so give me a second for that. This is because I have um, I have Git configured to require my commits to be signed, so that initial commit needs to be signed. Okay, now we're good. So I'll go go demo one, and um, I'm actually going to open a new VS Code window here so that we can see it in isolation. But, but um, I can easily do uh, uh, modus dev. And it's going to build and run that app the same way it built and run the other one. Notice though, it's a different, it's sort of a different layout because uh, this time it was a Go application. So instead of assembly script, I have Go code. I have a Go mod that has um, the Modus SDK for Go um, prepared for me. Um, I have a main.go file, and the scaffolding just creates this say hello function. But it it does indeed work. Um, I didn't run this with pre-release. So we'll run this with pre-release so that I can get the in-progress GraphQL Explorer. And you'll see run requests and it says, hello, and that's that. I can say, hello, demo gods. And it will say, hello, demo gods. So real simple uh, getting started application, but that would be it end to end. And that's all I have for you today. So I will turn it over to Will for maybe another short demo, or we could just turn it over to questions if there are questions queued up. Either would work. Yeah, let's, let's take a, a couple of questions, I think, before um, before we look at more demo. Um, 
Question here, kind of clarifying the, the model interface um, and asking, you know, what's the benefit of having having this model interface in Modus versus just say, you know, you have HTTP API in Modus, I, I could just call the OpenAI API directly. Like what's the benefit of having this model interface in Modus? Sure. Um, let me go back to the app where I was using it. Um, so there's there's a few things. Uh, first of all, um, the different components of it are sort of wired up for you, right? So we have we have lots of different models available, um, and they're all slightly different. So when you make an HTTP call to a model, um, what needs to be in that request is slightly different depending on what model you're calling. Not all models speak OpenAI, and not all models are LLMs. Uh, there's plenty of models that we work with that are embedding models or um, classification models or um, you know, just other types of models that are available. And having a, a nice, convenient way to say, um, you know, I want to like be in code and just be able to see all the different things that I can see with with uh, explanation here, you know, with uh, with all the IntelliSense, I basically got a full featured SDK for that model with all the things that model can do without having to go back and forth to like the OpenAI doc. Uh, without having to construct JSON manually, without having to um, pull in, you know, any other external sources. Um, so, like having that batteries included is something we thought was important. Um, the other nice thing that it does is the actual model um, calls are um, like where are they invoked. Like, notice I just said, please use the one that I call text generator out of the manifest. So, any amount of wiring it up to either hypermode or an external host is done in the manifest with just a few simple lines. Um, so if it was an external host here, I could um, provide a, uh, I believe it's, is it host uh, endpoint? I think it is. Um, and I could specify an endpoint. Um, actually, that's not it. I'll have to go back and remember what it is, but I can, I can configure it in the manifest to use a specific uh, connection. Um, and that will go off and talk to like OpenAI or Mistral or any of those other, um, you know, self-hosted models. And I didn't need to pull in those SDKs. Um, so that's the main benefit. Gotcha. And, and then we also have, you know, the ability to connect to like the hyper mode model hosting as well, I guess would be, uh, would be a, a related feature, um, something we can do if we're using the hyper mode platform, right? Yeah, I mean, I had a model running here that is, um, you know, everything worked on my local box and when it needed to make that model call, it knew to go and call hyper mode. And the reason it knew that is because I had done this before the call, but the, we have another CLI command uh, called hype. And if I just do, you know, hype help, you'll see that it has its own set of commands. And I logged in using hype login, uh, which went through, you know, I can do it right now, but it's just going to tell me I'm already logged in. Uh, so I do that, it's a prompt. Now, if I hadn't been logged in, a second here, it's gonna say, go ahead and close your window. Uh, hopefully, yeah, sign in. Let's see what happens now. So I will uh, watch anybody's uh, seeing me breaking up or anything. It's weird, this isn't working. I'm already signed in. I'm gonna just say you already signed in. Uh, but at the moment, I'm on a, on a hotspot because I've been dealing with a power outage for the last two days. So, uh, uh, hopefully everything's coming through well with the uh, with the that afterwards, and um, you know it's like other CLI that you use. Once you signed in, then the, your authentication information is written locally, so that when you go to run this in development, then you have um, those models available to you. If that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, I think any other we, questions? I think Matt was breaking up maybe just a little bit there with his. Um, this intermittent uh, uh, 4G hotspot um, since he's dealing with, uh, with the power outage there. Um, let's see, should we take another question? Um, question here kind of asking, um, or I guess clarifying the, the difference between MODIS and, and HyperMode. Like um, it seems like MODIS is an open source framework, but HyperMode is, 
is the platform. Could you clarify a little bit about that? Um, yeah, we, know, we, like we, we lost him. Looks yeah. like we lost Matt, which is cool. So yeah, I, I can answer that one. Um, yeah, so Modus is um, is a totally open source framework for building APIs. Um, you know, with the the functionality that that Matt showed, it's Apache two license, so you can um, you can build and host your Modus apps wherever you want. Um, we at Hypermode support the the Modus project, and then Hypermode platform has a hosting experience um, that you know we aim to be the best place to host Modus apps alongside also things like model hosting as well. Um, but yeah, Modus Modus is completely open source. You can use that without using uh, without using Hypermode. But again, we aim to be the best um, hosting experience for that. Great, looks like Matt uh, Matt is hey, back. Sorry, I got disconnected there. <laughs> no worries. We just had a question, kind of asking about the the difference of, of Modus and Hypermode, and um, we talked about talked about the distinction between the, the open source project and the hosting platform. So I think. Um, I think we took care of that question. OK. Let's see. Anything Should else? We take maybe, maybe Just one couple more, more question here. OK. Sure. Um, I guess this, is, this question is getting at, you know, could, could you talk a bit more about the, the benefits of using GraphQL? Um, and, you know, we're curious why, uh, why not just expose functions directly since you, you have this sort of mapping it looks like of functions that you're defining to graphql um, fields is there you know is there a benefit of of using um information from the function to, to build this graphql api it seems like there's some magic there could you maybe speak a little yeah. bit more about you know what, what's going on there yeah let me let me talk i can just talk through this um so when you write a function in in like um, say you're going to write a a REST service in in JavaScript or in any language really, and you say all right here's a like how would you normally do that? You'd write some kind of a handler and you give it a route, and you'd say all right if when the customer says get user three, I go to the get users route and I pass it a three and I get back a user object, and you say all right I can do the same thing in GraphQL. So what? What does it matter? Well. There's two reasons. Well, what if that user has other things like um, the products that they've purchased and um, their favorite colors and their, um, you know, each of the the products that they purchased has, um, uh, you know, a bunch of keywords with it and and other customers that have have bought the same products and so forth. Like you can build this whole graph of your entire data structure, and in a REST scenario, you have to say, no, 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 I only want this one little bit. But in a GraphQL scenario, you can allow the user to actually query to navigate the parts of the graph that they would like exposed. Um, and we enable that in Modus by allowing you to have very rich um, data objects that you return. Uh, one of the pieces of feedback that we've gotten and we are working on is that um, it would be helpful to know the entire uh, context of what the user's request was um, inside the Modus functions. So we're going to be writing up some APIs that will enable that, um, which again, like I said, we want to kind of take this end to end and that will take it then to that next step. Um, the other interesting thing is um, with GraphQL, your inputs can be fully structured objects. Um, so you might think of it like, well, in a REST scenario, you might post an object, but in GraphQL, you can actually have a complex graph that consists of many objects and you can provide that as part of your query and just say, you know what, this is, this is all input into this function. Um, and from Modus's perspective, it's just another class. You just provide it as a parameter on the input or on the output. Um, so GraphQL aligns really naturally. Um, the, uh, the other reason um, for GraphQL, which is something that we're, we're working on, is um, there's, a, um, there's an expansion of GraphQL called GraphQL Federation, uh, where a company might have their entire business on a single graph. And in that scenario, uh, a Modus app can be a subgraph within your federation, uh, meaning you might have uh, one Modus app that is like 
providing inventory data and another modus app that is providing um, customer information and another modus app that is doing uh, another you know microservice like thing in isolation but all participating in the same graph um, and that's really cool because you can just write one query that goes off to like 15 different things and maybe not all of it is modus maybe some of it is an existing federation um, schema that was there to go i don't know query your you know big mainframe server uh, and all that data can come and blend together and it seems like modus also <clears throat> solves a lot of the the challenges or like boilerplate of building graphql apis right like like in typical way you build a graphql api is you you have your type definitions your your schema and for every field and every type you have to write this resolver function that specifies like how do you actually fetch this data but but i don't see that in modus like in, in modus we're just writing a single function and i guess we're we're looking at like the what like the signature of the function it, it seems like we're using the types also yeah. to, to to define the, the type devs could, could you talk a little bit about how that works right what one of the things that the modus sdk does um, the language specific modus sdk i should say right now because there are two there's the assembly script sdk and the go sdk but one of the responsibilities of the go sdk is to observe the compilation process or either run it in line uh, in the case of assembly script because uh, there are hooks um, or in the case of go we run before and after the compilation to look at the source code and we'll look at we'll actually parse the source code or the AST provided by the compiler. And we'll find these function definitions that you are exporting along with all of the type information that they require, even if it's nested, even if it's 15 levels deep, um, we've got algorithm in place to extract all that information. And we, we save what we call metadata. Um, and that metadata is kind of obscured from your point of view, you don't really need to worry about it. But what actually happens is what happens in the metadata is appended to the WASM file. Uh, one of the nice things about WebAssembly is it supports the concept of, of custom data sections. So we can declare a custom data section and write our metadata to it during compilation. On the receiving side, once you, once you run this WASM file that was compiled with the Modus SDK, uh, we read that metadata and we say, oh, this user has a function called get quote. And maybe it takes in this parameter and it returns, you know, Maybe it's taking in um, the type of quote they want or, you know, a category or something. But we'll know from that that, hey, that's a string input uh, or maybe it's an array of string inputs or whatever it is. Um, and we'll know the output format. And because we know those things, we can translate them from our metadata format into GraphQL schema. So that's that's actually the really cool thing about the, uh, it was that little box that I said is a schema generator, um, is we generate your GraphQL schema for you. Um, and you don't have to worry about it. Like there is schema being generated and you never saw it. You can see it, there's a debug version of it uh, if you wanted to get in and actually see what the, the generated schema looks like. Um, but beyond that, like GraphQL has uh, schema introspection as part of the spec. So you don't really have to do that. You can point any GraphQL client right at your endpoint and it will through GraphQL schema introspection give you back the schema needed to make those calls and the better graphql clients out there will actually like give you strongly typed classes so you can make those calls um and that all works end to end uh without ever writing or touching a line of graphql schema so yeah i agree with you like um schema writing and and like the traditional way where you say all right i've got a resolver that needs to execute for this uh bit of schema um, it can be tedious and there's so many edge cases um and we just handle that all for you like you don't have to worry about it that's pretty amazing. So you're you're building a GraphQL API without having to write GraphQL type definitions or having to write resolvers. Uh, so you're you're taking away like you know two of the main, um, I, don't know, I mean like tedious parts of of working with GraphQL on the back end. That's that's pretty fascinating. Yep. So you have then the resolver the is the resolver the the equivalent of the resolver. It's not really a resolver, but the equivalent of resolver is what I was referring to as the data source, and it is built for you dynamically when you load your application into the runtime so it's a, it's available it's been it's been primed it, it is it is set up and and perfectly streamlined for that incoming execution um when when it's when the invocation actually comes along 
Um, so in many ways, we get the same um, characteristics as if you had written compile code in a resolver, but you didn't have to write that. You know, it's just it's just done for you at runtime through our execution plan and and the data source. That's super cool. Um, yeah, I've been I've been playing around with Modus a little bit. It's um, <clears throat> it's been fun to to start building um, you know intelligent APIs with it, and we're doing a you know a hackathon this month. So it's been fun to see you know what what folks are building and ideas that people have for using Modus for um, for really neat things. So yeah, it's been fun. All right, thanks, Max. Um, at explaining every single thing and answering some of the questions. Thank you, Will, for the time. And we'll talk to you guys soon in next edition, hopefully next month. Cheers. All right.